Whatever Became of the Great Gildersleeve, number two. My name is Richard Lamparski, and uh, I better explain that opening because I usually interview people just for people, but I can't very well say whatever became of Willard Waterman because he's, he's very active. He'll be telling you what he's doing in a few minutes in case you live on the West Coast and haven't seen Maine, one of the biggest smashes on Broadway this season. Um, but I had the great Gildersleeve number one on this program in the fall of 1965. His name was Hal Perry. And in case you missed that program, uh, maybe Mr. Waterman will explain all the, the difficulties there were with the, the part when it was um, they changed actors, so to speak. But anyway, uh, welcome, Willard Waterman. Are you living Thank now you. in New York? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I still consider Los Angeles my home. However, I have been here since uh, February 21st last year when I came into set rehearsals on Maine. And uh, as you can see, it's well over a year. Uh, and, of course, I don't know how long uh, in the future I will stay. Uh, I may have such a wonderful show, such a pleasant experience. <coughs> Our girl Angela is such a lovely lady that uh, the company is a very happy experience. And uh, I certainly will stay with it until something better for me comes along. Gildersleeve originated from the coast, as I recall, though, didn't it not? Yes, yes. Um, the TV series, too? Actually, uh, oh, yes, we, we taped, uh, we uh, filmed the uh, TV series at the old Hal Roach Studios. Mm -hmm. in, um, were you out there when you were chosen for the role? Yes, yes. I, I went to the West Coast. I was in Chicago from 1934 to 1946 in radio, uh, all the old soap operas and and the nighttime shows, First Nighter, Grand Hotel. First oh, Nighter, gee, yeah. I remember that. The little theater off yeah. Times Square. Smoking out downstairs in the other place. And in the other <laughs> yeah. And he always got a cab right after the theater break. I yeah. could never understand that <laughs> well, once he, I got to New I York. I think he had the way in some place. <laughs> but uh, in 1946, I was doing a show called Those Webster's. And uh, everything at that time was moving out of Chicago. And uh, this was the last contract that I had left. And I rather assumed that uh, in the spring of 46 it would fade from the air. So I came into New York here to look around and see if I get my feet in the ground, decide whether I might like to try to make a living here. And uh, I was here for four or five days, and I made some contacts, and I was all set, really, to move in here in the fall. 46, and um, <clears throat> I went back to Chicago and found not only, not only were they renewing the show, but they were taking it to the West Coast. So uh, we one Sunday did our show from Chicago, and <clears throat> during the week we all caravaned out to to Los Angeles and uh, did the next show from out there, and it continued for two more years, and what, which gave me an opportunity to break into West Coast radio, and then later, and, and also motion pictures, and, and uh, later television. You know, it strikes me as I sit here talking to you and, and looking at you and listening to you, I, I was going to say, before we met this morning, gee, your voice is so similar, because I'd heard it, you know, to Hal Perry's, but looking at you, do people <coughs> tell you you look like David Merrick? Yes. It's yes. amazing, really, how much you as look like him. As a matter of fact, I, I scared, I guess, Bobby Fryer, our producer, Brad Carton Harris, to death uh, when we first started wearing wardrobe and dress rehearsal. Uh, <clears throat> they had me in a Hamburg hat. Which is what he wears. Which is what it? he wears. And I walked on stage and he said, no, no, get that off of him. Get it off of him quick. <laughs> so they put me in a bowler term. Have you met Mr. Merrick? No, I haven't. But I, I saw him uh, the other night on the Carson show. And uh, I can see the resemblance. I mean, I'm sure. Very definite. If we uh, side by side, there wouldn't be any. Uh, uh, it, it actually is like a lot like the the uh, resemblance uh, uh, between Hal Perry and myself. Side by side, we're nothing alike at all, except that we both have a round face, we both have a mustache, we both we have a voice that's that uh, the timber is similar. I think mine's a little. Lower than his, but the but the timber is, is very similar, <clears throat> and um, you uh, the people naturally because we both play the same character, people confuse us. 
but uh, uh, I uh, have been in Hollywood and um, uh, had people out of our studio audience when we were taping uh, Go to Sleep show say, oh, I saw you on Waltz Time last night. You were wonderful. Now, you wouldn't know, but that was a, a television show called Waltz Time on the West Coast Local Code that Hal was doing for a while. And uh, uh, I said, here he's looking at me, and he'd seen Hal the night before and and, uh, and still confused the two of us. Well, now, so, you have met, then, Hal Perry. Have met? Oh, of yeah. course. Did well, you know him before? Hal and I both worked together in Chicago in radio for years. We, he used to play uh, Hod Barrett on uh, Tom Mix, the kid show Tom Mix, and I did Diamonds, the other villain. And That's funny. I remember your character, but not his. You remember Hod Barrett? You remember? No, but I remember no. Diamonds. Yeah. yeah. So Who played there. Wrangler? Uh, Percy Hemus. Is he still around? Uh, well, he, he was the original. And then... Uh, uh, no, no, the, the, Percy Hemus was the... No, I, I'm sure he's not around. Yeah, he did the commercials. Yeah. Take a tip from Tom, go and tell your mom that yeah. she read Ralston Copy <laughs> Beat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and uh, Leo Curley did Sheriff... The Sheriff, uh, oh, what's his name? It's funny how those things flow from you sometimes. When you were picked to fill in for... Uh, to take the role of Great Gildersleeve, was there any uh, hard feeling between you and Mr. Perry? I don't believe so, no. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Hal thought that what he was doing uh, was was right, and uh, and he it wasn't any question of my uh, undercutting him for the job or anything like that. And we we have been uh, good friends since we we uh, oh a couple of years ago we went on a Freedom Week junket to St. Paul together, and we had St. Paul completely confused. <laughs> was he married when you knew him? I, uh, Twice. <laughs> well, he has, uh, I guess she's not a <coughs> new wife now. Three because times, yes. I'm not his new wife. You have a girl from, I think, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Because he said be sure to let her in-law or his in-laws know in New Jersey when yeah. the program would be on. And yeah, well, I, uh, uh, when they were just married in 64, I believe it was, and uh, he was going through uh, Chicago to do... Uh, Solid Gold Cadillac, I believe, up in Michigan, one of the, the summer theaters. And he stopped by uh, the Schubert in, in uh, Chicago and came backstage. And we, so we, we spent really a lot of time together. We, uh, as I say, back in the early days of, uh, of the soap operas and, um, and even in First Night in Grand Hotel, it was one of those things when we both were cast in the same show, it was, uh, well, you go high and I'll go low. <laughs> Was Don Amici the first nighter when you did it? Uh, yes, he was the lead in first nighter, not yeah. the first nighter. Uh, he played the less remain part. Yeah, he, he, mm. he did the leads. The first nighter was uh, 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 Charles F. Hughes originally. Was there just one actress with him all the time, or were there? Yeah, no. Uh, um, June Meredith was the original lead in first nighter, and then Anne Seymour was the lead opposite Don in Grand Hotel. And then uh, Betty Lou Gerson. I think Betty Lou Gerson replaced June Meredith. I, uh, there might have been one in between there. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Lester Maine uh, replaced uh, Don <coughs> and uh, after that Olin Soleil. Barbara Luddy. And Barbara Luddy, yes. And um, uh, uh, I, I think I, I, I even did a couple of these. Uh, Ed Prentice did a couple. There was one time during the, the transition between, I guess, Les and, um, and Owen where they were sort of shopping the leads around. Uh, there was a special Christmas show that I, I would hope a lot of people would remember. I remember it very fondly. <coughs> and... Uh, it was done every year, and uh, uh, I think I had the distinction of playing every part in it but Mary <laughs> at one time <laughs> through the years. For the for the benefit of, of young people listening who don't remember the 
uh, debacle over the Great Gildersleeve and for older people who, you know, just, <clears throat> it's hazy in their minds. Would you tell briefly what happened? Well, uh, as you probably know, the Gildersleeve character was originated by Don Quinn in Fibrogi and Molly. Right, he was a char- yeah, running he was character. Running character in the show when the show originated in Chicago. And then, <clears throat> that was probably about 30 eight or thirty nine, I don't know exactly. Maybe it may have been a year earlier than that. But then the show as a show was taken to the West Coast and Hal Perry, who was playing Gildersleeve, uh, in in the show, went with the show. Then in nineteen forty one, Needham Lewis and Brorby, who was the agency, uh, at that time there another, another name now. Uh, they took the character Gildersleeve out of the Fibber Media Mali show and built the show around it for Kraft. And um, Hal played it on radio from 1941 until 1950, during which time he uh, did three, I believe, RKO ghostly pictures, which have recently been on television. So uh, uh, that, uh, that's another area of confusion, I guess. In 1950, Hal <coughs> left the show. It was during the time of... You remember when CBS was doing all the rating of NBC's talents? Yes, they, yeah, they brought over Jack Benny and yes, Amos and Landy. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and Hal's agency, uh, uh, talent agency, uh, sold him on a contract to NBC. And I guess they figured that the show would go with him. But for some reason or other, Kraft didn't want to leave NBC. And uh, so it came to the question of recasting. And um, I, uh, I was not at all sure that I wanted to, to uh, sort of put my career on the line in, in, uh, in, in a replacement of the, that kind. And I don't think that Needham, Lewis, and Barbie were very sure what they wanted to do, whether they wanted to go with <coughs> a similar character or, or something completely different, uh, different voice and all. And um, so they asked me if I would mind reading it, and I said, you know, I said, don't, it's not a, an audition, but uh, maybe, so we talked about it a good deal up to then, I said, maybe you uh, uh, will make a decision from having a chance to read it, uh, and we also might be able to make our decision. And I went in and, um, and started reading the script, and um, I found that, that uh, the character was so well, so well written, <coughs> so well determined, that uh, there was no question of doing a, a uh, imitation. It, it, it wasn't with the vocal quality that we had that was close. There wasn't any necessity of trying to imitate. It just the character uh, was a forceful character, and, and, and when you played it that way, it, it came out with the, uh, the uh, guiltlessly characterization. And uh, uh, one thing that is... Uh, unbelievable uh, to, to most people because they remember the Gildersleeve laugh. I was just going to ask you about that. And um, I, I didn't use it. I, I used to do the, what they used to call the Gildersleeve social chuckle. Like, <laughs> but uh, the <laughs> laugh. But you see, you can do it. Can well, you? I can do it, yes. And I, I get trapped because <laughs> people say, let me hear you laugh. You know, <laughs> So I can... But uh, that, that was a, a, a characteristic... I mean, I laughed. As character, any character has to laugh. But I stayed away from that. I did all the, well, you know, the dip thong stuff. But um, uh, yeah, the laugh as such, I didn't use. And nobody will believe it because it was so well implanted. But Hal used to use that laugh before uh, he did Gildersleeve. <laughs> he did a, a character called Professor Rowell on a show for Alka Seltzer called Thank You, Stooja. Which nobody will probably ever remember. And in fact, I don't know that we were talking about that radio's golden age. I've forgotten to look to see if it's ever in there. It just occurred to me now. But he used that laugh then. And so I never did use that laugh as such. Anyway, I, I uh, did the first program with uh, much fear and trepidation. And uh, uh, fortunately, the reviews were good and continued. And um, I did the radio show from 1950 then until 19. 19- 59, and during which time I did the uh, uh, one season 
39 syndicated films of the uh, Ghost Leaf television. How did the uh, the cast react when you went into the part? Because well, that, uh, with one change, I, I'm again referring to that book you mentioned, uh, Radio's Golden Age. There was only one, I think, uh, uh, Lorene Tuttle had played Marjorie and uh, Mary Lee Robb, I guess. Yes. Did it. There was another one, Louise. Louise Erickson in between, I think. Erickson, Louise. But for the most part, I think they were the same actors right from the beginning, weren't they? Yes, Leroy the, and Bertie. Yeah, and... Uh, Walter Tetley, of course, was the Leroy. Earl Ross, who was Judge Hooker, the old goat. And uh, uh, Peavy. Uh, Wasn't there a mayor to Williker? Was there? Oh, yes, that was uh, Stan Farrar. I just thought of that. Isn't that yeah, funny? Mer- mer- <laughs> I just thought of that in years. Yeah. And um, they lived in Somerville. Uh, not... not Summerfield. Summerfield, yeah. It's pretty close. It was close, <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, the, the, the cast were, uh, to answer your question, the cast were very nice, very helpful. They, they of course, had been used to Hal. And, uh, uh, but they were very nice to me. And They didn't feel resentful then? Yeah. No, I don't believe so. Yeah. At least Actors are pretty did. good, I think, yeah. about that. Uh, they, I think they all knew pretty much the circumstances surrounding it. And... and uh, and realized that I was uh, in a pretty precarious position, quite a spot, as a matter of fact, in the replacement, and they were very helpful to me. Do you ever see uh, uh, Ron Keith, who is your Leroy? I guess he's a big boy now. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen him in... Uh, well, I have seen him since we finished uh, filming the, the, uh, the television series, but I understand he's quite a recording artist, and uh, he was... Um, working hard on the guitar and singing the last time I I doubt him. very much that I think the kids who listen to him re- realize that he was you know the little boy actor on yeah. that he's a young man now oh yes he's uh, well see we did that in 55 and 56 and he was I think we celebrated his 12th birthday if I'm not mistaken on the show frightening, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we were mentioning, or you nearly laughed like that. <laughs> <laughs> we were mentioning Ferb McGee and Molly, who were, I think, one of the great, great teams oh, on, yes, on radio, and I understand began the first uh, soap opera, the smack out, so Virginia yeah. Payne tells me, many years ago. And well, that, that and they also did uh, Colton Myers' Kindergarten. No, I, I didn't know that, that at was, all. Yeah, that was, was that a Chicago show, That too? was a Chicago show. It was a network mm-hmm. show, but it was originated in Chicago, and uh, uh, that was, I don't know it was before or after Smackouts or maybe along the same time. Yeah, because uh, I guess they didn't choose to go into television and didn't continue in radio. And they they didn't want to do television, really. They did make a pilot, but very half-hearted. They, they, uh, it, it didn't come out well, I understand, principally because they really didn't want to do television. They, they, weren't, uh, they weren't interested. In it, so yeah. They loved radio. And they continued to, even after the show went off for a long time, with with those little vignettes on monitor. Which were very cute. Which were yeah. very cute, yeah. Now Molly has passed away, God rest her soul. Yes. And, and Jim Jordan, who played Fibber McGee, remarried. And I understand moved to um, Hawaii quite recently. Well, that I didn't know. I just heard that, um, I think, two weeks ago. <laughs> I got a letter from somebody, and uh, they said he was living out in Hawaii. But I have a recording of... Um, a Fibber McGee and Molly program for those who can't remember and those who would like to remember, too. And I haven't heard it myself, but I know it's funny and good because all their programs were. So if uh, if we're ready in the control booth, let's listen to This is what uh, Fibber McGee and Molly sounded like. What are you reading, dearie? Wimple's bird book. <laughs> he left it here last night. And you never read such a miss of mass information in your life. It's awful. Well, if it's that bad, why do you read it? It's so garbled, it... It fascinates me. <laughs> this book has got more wrong answers than a nervous housewife on Take It or Leave It. <laughs> Look at the title, even. American Birds and Their Habits. They can't even spell habits, you see? Where? There. Oh, that word isn't habits, dearie. It's habitat. Oh. Well, what I want to know is what their habits are. Who cares where they have their habitat? <laughs> Any bird lover who reads this would throw eggs at the publisher. <laughs> Say, when did you become such a bird lover, lover? (laughs) Ever since the first time I had quail with wild rice. (laughs) What particular statement in that book are you quarreling with? Well, listen to what it says about the feeding habitats of the pelican. All right. It says the pelican feeds occasionally on other things besides fish. 
but it definitely prefers marine life. Now, that is ridiculous. Why is it? There ain't a pelican living that could get in the Marines. <laughs> Why? They even turned me down twice. Dearie, that isn't what that means. Huh? Besides, I think you're being too critical. After all, you're not much of an expert on bird life. Who ain't? You ain't. Huh? I mean, you aren't. Oh, 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 oh the heck I aren't. <laughs> Who was it worked his way through high school raising baby chicks and even invented a slot machine that would dispense them two for a quarter? <laughs> And who was it that a chewing gum took his idea and beat him to the patent office? What chewing gum? Chicklets. <laughs> That's why I say these people are right these... Come in. Oh, it's Wallace Wimple. Hi, Wimp. Hello, Mr. Wimple. Hello, folks. <laughs> we were just reading your bird book, Mr. Wimple. Hope you don't mind. Oh, not at all, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> I'm glad to know where I left it. <laughs> I'm afraid I was rather upset when I left here last night. Yeah, we, we noticed that, Wimp. <laughs> Why? Did I do something? Well, we had the radio turned on to a political rap. Yeah, oh, I remember yeah. now. A deep voice snarled, Wallace is going to get the beating of his life. And I went right out the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> hey, how are you getting along these days with her, Wimp? You mean, sweetie face? My, my big old wife. <laughs> yes. Oh, about as usual. We had a little tiff yesterday. Believe me, Sweetie Face puts up a tough tiff. <laughs> what was it about, Wimp? Oh, it was nothing, really. No? She came back from downtown with a new hairdo and... Asked me how I liked it. Then? <laughs> and I told it. <laughs> Frankly, sweetie face, I said, it looks like an explosion in an Excelsior factory. Oh. I said, or a crew haircut with mutiny on the poop deck. <laughs> I don't blame them for dyeing your hair, I said, but they waited too long to embalm it. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. And then out loud, I said... It... <laughs> I said, it looks simply beautiful, dear. <laughs> Why, gosh, how could she object to that? <laughs> oh, she knows me so well. <laughs> she ignored the compliments on my lips and tried to slap the expression off my face. <laughs> when I ducked, she... Oh, speaking of ducks... Did you enjoy reading my bird book? Yeah. No. What? Confidentially, Wimp, this book is fuller of tripe than the inside of a cow. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. McGee. This is the finest bird book there is. <laughs> this is the authority on birds. It tells about the dodo bird disappearing, the migratory habits of the snow goose, yeah. how the passenger pigeon became extinct. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What was that again? You mean about the passenger pigeon? Yeah, that. Well, it says on page 49, and I quote, mm -hmm. The passenger pigeon, which once swarmed over the North American continent by the millions, has become completely extinct. Yeah. The last known passenger pigeon died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. Exactly. That's just what I mean. That is a falsehood. What do you mean, McGee? I mean I saw a passenger pigeon today. I've seen one every day for weeks. Oh, my goodness, Mr. McGee. If what you say is true... And it is. If you actually saw a real live passenger pigeon, why, why, any zoo in the country would pay thousands for one. You mean thousands of money? Thousands of dollars for one pigeon, Mr. Wimple? Are you oh. sure it was a passenger pigeon, McGee? Why, sure I'm sure it was a passenger pigeon. Hey, if there was that kind of dough, I could trap that thing in Sulphur. Oh, my gosh. Where's my hammer? Where's my tool? I've got to make a trap. Where's my screwdriver? I'll I don't know, Mr. McGee. I'm just a guest here. Oh, I know. I left it right here in the hall closet. No, don't open that door, McGee. <laughs> So that's what they sounded like. Yeah, I've mentioned them so was, many times on the air. That was Tommy Horan, the sound man, making the classic noises. 
Was it really? Yeah. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. He should have gotten credit for that because that was one of the most famous <laughs> sounds, I guess, in yeah, radio. I, so, yeah. I wonder if kids uh, listening in or young people who don't remember the program realize how funny that was. Everybody uh, waited for it. Every, it was, yeah. It was, every week. It was a weekly the famous... gag. And always waited until the last shoe dropped, you know. Maybe <laughs> I laughed out of, uh, you know, reaction or nostalgia, but it seemed funny well, I, to me I think, again. I think anybody who heard this show regularly and, and it realized it was a running gag, as you say, mm -hmm. Uh, waited for it, and uh, it probably wouldn't be terribly funny to somebody who heard it the first time. That little bell at the end. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my favorite character on that program and, and on yours was Mr. Peavy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, Peavy never appeared on, on Fibber. No. Oh, really? What did they call him just then? Well, that was Walt Wallace Wimple. Wallace Wimple, I'm sorry, because it was yeah, a, a similar, very similar yeah. uh, voice and character, I think. Somewhat the same, yes. Uh, uh, Peavy was a little more droll, and and um, you know, remember his, um, his famous line was, "Well, no, I wouldn't say that." That was right. That I always got that confused yeah. with my big old wife. Yeah, which is well, what he just Tweety said. Pie, Sweetie yeah. Pie. That was yeah. Walt Whitman's yeah. wife. Uh, but uh, no, Peavy was the druggist on on uh, and one of the Jolly Boys on uh, on uh, Gildersleeve. Mr. Gildersleeve sang, too, didn't he, Throckmorton? Yeah, Day. well, the, the Jolly Boys quartet was always a, a big item on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Leela Ransom was yeah. held in a trance. <laughs> yeah, she was the, uh, the femme fatale, the, the southern... Did she woman. really have a southern accent? Uh, uh, it was Shirley Mitchell who played the part, and she... No, she wasn't southern. Did you wind up the show uh, when, when you closed the series? Did he get married or no. was anything resolved? No, no, no. So they might come, could come back any time. Oh, I suppose could, but... Uh, still be the eligible no. bachelor. Yeah. Well, there's no reason why that would date, really. No. No, it, uh, no there was no uh, resolvement of uh, as many uh, peccadillos. Do you, do you miss working on radio? I think anybody who ever did work on it missed I always it. ask that, and I always yeah. get that answer. Because it was... Uh, it was I think... Uh, <laughs> I think it was uh, Burns, Burns and Allen... <coughs> Excuse me. I made the statement. The more television they did, the more they realized they stole every dime they ever made at radio. And I, I think uh, it's true. That radio was a wonderful medium. Uh, the the facility that the audience had of building their own sets and, uh, in imagination, in their mind. Uh, there were shows that you could do on radio that would practically be impossible on television. I mean. Uh, I'm thinking one particular lights out, uh, which was the old horror show with sound and and uh, and mood. You could build pictures in the mind that would, in television, take the uh, the budget of a of a complete uh, Alfred Hitchcock full length movie uh, because you could the effects were so easy to do. With uh, I remember uh, one where. Somebody had their head chopped off, and it was very simple to chop a head of cabbage and have the head fall in the basket. So it was a very terrifying sound of radio. Whereas, in, uh, how would you, how would you do that in television? Yeah, well, they chop heads, but chop not heads. so you see them. Heads roll. There's no question about that. But it, it was a, a, a wonderful medium, and uh, those of us, it was a great training ground. Uh, many, many people came out of uh, of Chicago radio that. Uh, have gone <clears throat> in pictures, uh, in television, in um, the theater, and, and uh, all facets of show business. Well, I'm not a performer, but I know even when I, you know, go around as I do to promote my book to radio and TV, I always look forward to doing radio, even if it's uh, an interviewer I don't know or maybe I don't particularly like their manner. But I always like it because it's a, it's a fun thing to do. I, yeah. I love radio. I, I look forward to doing this program and doing other people's. Mm -hmm. But television, uh, I don't know, it means you have to go put on makeup and I have to change my shirt and <laughs> is the tie right and, uh, and all of that. And it, it isn't the same. Well, it, uh, it doesn't have the relaxed quality. Of, uh, not that, that we, uh, we... We had fun doing radio. A great deal of fun. I, I think the element that wasn't there was the great expense of of production, that is, uh, television costs a doggone much that you just can't fool around. For instance, when you're doing film for television, it, it's a matter of doing 35 and 40 setups 
a day so that you can get your 18, 19 pages. Uh, whereas uh, radio, you, you had time. Well, we didn't take a lot of time. We, most of the soap operas we did with one-hour rehearsal. But um, <clears throat> there, were, there were amusing things and uh, things that happened uh, that you, I suppose, the horseplay that kept it light and free and gay, and, and uh, uh, there wasn't the seriousness that uh, is involved in television. Well, this has been very enjoyable uh, visiting with you and hearing your voice again. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, if anybody wants to hear it even more, what, th what theater are you playing in? Uh, we're at the Winter Garden in uh -huh. um, Maine. 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 Smash hit. Well, thanks very much, Willard Waterman. Pleasure, Number two, Great Gildersleeve, and uh, now Star of Maine. Thank you.